This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. All right, what's up, claimants to the Driftwood throne? Good luck to you. This is Stephen, your host from Pathology Podcast. I'm here with my lifelong friend, Josh, and our grand maester and friend, Hayden. Uh, it's always fun to get Hayden on here. He provides some expert opinion, if you will. And uh, we're going to be talking about episode eight of House of the Dragon, which a lot of people have said was like their favorite episode yet. So is that what you guys thought? I did personally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was up there, up there with the best. Um, you know, it, it didn't quite have like a battle, which I think is always a mainstay of like a Game of Thrones um, uh, episode. But I think that this had all the drama and intrigue of like the best of the best. So, yeah, so no battle, but plenty of other intrigue and probably some of the uh, most hardcore violence that we've seen so far, which kind of came out of like I jumped a little bit. So, oh, OK, that just happened. <laughs> That, that was awesome. I mean, I don't think I'd Josh ever really... Josh is here for it, though. <laughs> well, Hayden gave us a little bit of a heads up because Hayden watched it. Um, Mackenzie and I couldn't watch it until our kids were asleep. So Hayden was like, okay. I'm not going to wait for you guys to watch it. <laughs> I want to rewatch it with us. Um, so Hayden was like, Mackenzie gets a little squeamish. And so Hayden gave mm-hmm. us a heads up that she might want to... I want to avert your avert, eyes here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it was like a it's like a lightsaber, dude. Like, just... Dude, it's, that thing. it's Valerian still. Valerian still. Yeah, right. It cuts uh, cuts sharp. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever seen Valerian. Like, I've heard, I think this really brought home Valerian still for me, like a non book reader of like, it It happened. They had it in Game of Thrones, but I don't think we got like a demonstration like that. You know what I mean? Like, they were kind of just mm. talked about Valerian still. Like, it was really cool. And I thought it was more like it was just valuable to me, like a kind of like uh-huh. platinum or like a really just valuable thing because of its rarity. I mean, rarity. doesn't doesn't Ned cut off the deserter's head with ice in the first episode? Yeah, cuts it clean off. Yeah, but that that to me it was because like you had got this like big bulky guy who like you know it, like massive yeah. sword, or, like yeah, massive yeah, sword, okay, yeah. yeah, cleaves, yeah. yeah. But this was like, and it was almost like a showing. It was more like that was a character development for Ned than like the sword, you know. I mean, that he was gonna mm-hmm. have the strength to do what needed to be done. Um, whereas this was like I it, obviously character development yeah. for Damon too, I, but like yeah. I feel that Damon was uh just waiting for that moment, you know. Uh-huh. He's like, say it. Please. Yeah, 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 before, yeah. He's, give me a reason. <laughs> exactly. And uh it's it's funny because he um I feel like this whole time he's just wanted to be like Viserys's like assassin, like his like go to like send me to do your dirty work, let me take care of business, you know. Uh, but Viserys doesn't make those calls, uh, and in this instance, he's like he gets that opportunity. So Viserys gave him enough, yeah, <laughs> but just just enough. Um, and uh, Damon had his own little twist to it and said he could keep his tongue. <laughs> that was awesome oh my gosh okay yeah the the prosthetics this episode just on like a you know i know we usually talk about the story but the prosthetics mm-hmm. between like the 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 visuals for that um and then the visuals for preserves yeah. though they were spectacular amazing the makeup everything just, yeah beautiful and the acting beautiful. from patty constantine right that's the same name yeah the acting was really good really convincing seriously yeah if he doesn't win an emmy for that like that was a outstanding performance that was really needed i think to sell the character development like if that performance didn't come in as strong as it did i think that mm-hmm. i think that um you know that the character might have fallen a little bit flat just because he's been very well developed the whole time but hasn't had that like showing of strength so to get that like showing of strength at his weakest time i think really brought home the character for me at least yeah yeah, per- personally for me, that that scene in the throne room was one of the best scenes I've seen in Westeros. <laughs> you know, in all of Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. it was just mm-hmm. so powerful um, watching him come in and slowly make his way to the throne. And they didn't cut it. You know, they didn't make it more comfortable for us. <laughs> we uh-huh. just sat we there all and felt watched the awkwardness it. And, we felt yeah. it. And uh, we felt it when Damon helped him up and put the crown back on his head. Apparently, that wasn't even scripted. Really? And Matt Smith just did that on his own. 
Oh, which dude. I think is really cool. They put the crown on his head or helped him all the way up the both. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, hmm. yeah. Dang, that's pretty cool. That's gonna that's gonna be like that scene in Lord of the Rings where Aragon kicks the helmet, and it's like everybody knows they broke his toe and they kept it in. But like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, and all the garage is like, somebody's gonna say it. Somebody's gonna say it. Yep. <laughs> like, uh-huh. That wasn't scripted, but yeah, yeah that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're all about in uh, House of the Dragon. They're all about that slow buildup of tension that's happened a few times throughout the season, and it's uh, it, it's really kind of like game of thrones brand i i think to have that like mounting you know something's going to happen here and then finally it does yeah it pays off eventually yeah okay so i do have i have one gripe with the uh with the episode and i want to get into that so maybe we should do it now since i know we're limited on time and then we'll circle back around to whatever you guys want to talk about so here's the deal I don't like the prophecy thing. I haven't since the very first episode. I was really concerned that the the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy was going to be a big deal. And then then it went away for a while. So I I wasn't as concerned. But now it's like, I don't, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the next episode, but it seems like it's now the, like the plot device to say like, okay, the war is actually going to start because Alicent is in fact going to put Aegon forward, but until the miscommunication there uh, in Viserys's final words, until that happened, it seemed like, oh, you know, maybe the family is going to be all happy. But then because of this miscommunication around the prophecy plot device, which I didn't like ever, now I'm concerned that that's going to be like the reason for everything. And I don't like that. You're spontaneous. Let's yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I can see where you're coming from. Um, I definitely understand that point of view, uh, especially when it comes to the prophecy being um, something they introduced right off the bat um, to carry kind of Rhaenyra's mm-hmm. character, and then mm-hmm. to to plug it in and make it uh, shift everything that had happened previously in that character development. Because they had finally chosen, you know, to make up, um, at least Allison and Rhaenyra did. I don't think the kids would have ever made up. Uh, you know, I don't yeah. think Otto or Laris would have let go what they, you know, their ambitions. Um, right. So I don't think it's completely like even if that prophecy um, wasn't, uh, you know, misunderstood in this way, I still feel like there would be some. Um, I still feel like that it would be divided, you know. Okay, I agree, I agree. Um, so I don't, I don't think it drives the whole plot. I think it just adds a, a little bit in my mind. It just feels like it adds a little bit of texture to it. So I, I feel like without this prophecy, then there would be really no sim- reason to have sympathy for the greens. You know what I mean? Because if this, if I mean, I, again, I don't know how it went in the book, but with how it, uh-huh. ended, with how that episode was going to end, with kind of Renera and and Allison making up, then like, right. then they both seem like like her kid, both of their kids obviously have issues with each other, but they both like respect slash fear their parents enough not to like get too far out of line. Maybe not Aegon or uh, Aemon, Aemon, mm-hmm. uh, maybe, Aemon. maybe not him, but like all the other kids, kind of like. Uh, you know, would have been able to be kept in line by their parents, at least for the foreseeable future. So I feel like without, um, I, I don't really know how we would have gotten any more conflict without this, unless mm-hmm. w- unless it was coming from Otto and Laris, which I feel like, I hope that it kind of like, the, that's where the conflict is driving, like Otto and Laris. And then Allison's on board because she like, kind of like, even if she doesn't fully believe that, he was talking like telling her the truth or like that she was getting that like it gives her enough like plausible deniability to go along with like her father's plan like okay yeah i might be uncomfortable with this but i have a reason for it i completely agree i think that it just gives her just enough Mm -hmm. to put her back on the side of her sons because uh like her her dad Otto, is the one that's been convincing her uh, that Rhaenyra would, you know, just bloodthirsty. Yeah, like go after right. her children and stuff, and I, you know, it, that just seems so out of character for her. Um, and and so to, 
for him to be that person to tell her those things um, and then her to change her mind and want to forgive uh, Rhaenyra. Um, it just seems like, I don't know. It seems like there's more, um, there's just a little bit more added on, you know, in that plot, mm. a, li- a little bit, just a little bit of texture. I, I don't know. For me, uh-huh, it was spicy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was good. Also as a book reader, uh, I really enjoy the prophecy um, because I think it lines up with so much uh, in the well, book. So I, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll agree to delay my opinion on this matter until episode nine. And I'm okay. If it goes like how you said, I would be okay with that. Where if it's just like one more thing, if Allison comes out in episode nine and she's like, you know, screw everything at the dinner, we're going for egg on hardcore. Like, mm, I, don't, I don't know if I really am bored with that. And I like the prophecy. I like, okay, I like prophecies in epic fantasy. Prophecies are fun. And I'm okay with this prophecy. The issue is we've already seen this prophecy run its course on the previous TV show on Game of Thrones. And it meant nothing. It was like, it was a complete flop. I hated it. I mean, I, I didn't hate all of the ending of the TV show, but this particular plot line was completely dropped. And so if I could remove that and say like, okay, I'm just going to go with George's books and assume that he will end things in a much better way, then I could probably be okay with everything. But the fact that the TV show played out the way it is, has really soured me to this whole idea. Like it's more just kind of subverting a trope that's already been subverted. Like the whole idea that like the big bad from the North, like actually wasn't that big of a threat. Like that was like the subversion of the trope, right? And we we already saw that it was subverted, and now it's just like yeah, but I don't think that into it. like I don't think George R. R. Martin meant to subvert it like that. I think that's think so? just kind of what happened in in the TV show. Like, I think he's okay. going to make the ending much better. Oh, I agree. So so you because I that was the kind of thing I thought was that like yeah I don't know it was that the the big the big bad wasn't actually that big of a deal so it was like the North kind of was making a mountain out of them all. I just think it was lazy writing and D&D wanted to be done with the show. And so that's what they did. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's more to the story, but that, that's how it came across to me. Like, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's a whole different. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we talked about <laughs> house of the dragon. Yeah. 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 And uh, I get that it's the same, it's the same, you know, canon from show to show, or that's what they're trying to do. Uh, so it does make it difficult to like even care about this prophecy that later right. we see because they're like this to... prophecy is super important and we've got to keep the house together so we can defend the realm but actually we've already seen eight seasons of game of thrones and we know that it doesn't even matter yeah except for valerian steel right does still take take down the the white walker guy yeah he destroys the entire army Maybe why does wasn't... why does the targaryen house need to be together in order for that to happen yeah i guess they yeah i mean yeah. maybe if danny would have been dragons it, it, Drag Danny, but like she didn't even make that big of a dent in that battle really right like they exactly still got through. I, I can't remember it really, yeah but like they still got through and it was still like they still invaded the whole thing and then Arya just like magically up here of nowhere and killed the white walker king and everybody yeah. disintegrated right like yeah danny didn't even make that big of a difference yeah i don't yeah. know yeah Anyway, okay, so what else did you guys like about episode eight now that I've <laughs> had my beef? Uh, so aside from the the, the scene of um, King Daddy Viserys walking to the throne and sitting it, um, the other mm-hmm. scene that really got me was the feast. And I think others can agree that that, that feast yeah. was so intense. Uh, people are calling it the Last Supper. Uh, Viserys' uh-huh. um, last opportunity to kind of you bring his bring everyone together or his you know wish to bring everyone together um that doesn't play out exactly how he would like but at least he got to have like a moment of seeing everyone happy and dancing and i I mean the great thing is from his opinion it did like he or from his perspective he he didn't see the breakdown after amon's toast yeah yeah that's true um just going kind of rapid fire. I think my favorite scene of the of the episode, besides the ones that have been mentioned, was the scene with Alicent and the and the serving girl that um Aegon had raped. 
Um, one because like it contrasted with that with that scene with Cersei, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was trying to figure out why I was so apprehensive about it, and then Hayden brought up that Cersei had the girl killed, right? That well, uh, something. Yeah, I mean, if you're thinking of Allison like Cersei, there are mm-hmm. instances in which, yeah, she would definitely have made different calls in the those those kinds of situations. There, there's not like a specific one that's okay exactly like that. It, um, but but yes <laughs> yeah the use of silence during that scene like there's no background it was just like so intense of allison and the serving girl and like i thought that allison was just like might just have her killed you know and that was gonna really freak me out and and so the fact like it was just such such a high tension like high tension scene or very tense scene for me um mm. i really liked it um because we so, didn't know where allison was at you know and after that the girl who reports back to Oh gosh, what's her name? The white worm, uh, Damon's former lover, Masaria. Masar, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so that's that was her, right? The the uh, one who comes in with the tea afterwards. Yep. Oh, that was her. Yeah, oh, I didn't pick N- that up. Natalia, something like that. I think so. Yeah. So there. What one complaint I do have is it seems like so she is going to be a character. We haven't seen her for like four episodes, and now she's back and apparently has some secrets but we also haven't seen laris in a couple episodes and like he had such a strong uh play in episode six that now for him to be completely absent kind of miss that yeah yeah that, that's true it uh we don't really know what she's been doing in the shadows but uh we did get you know the the instance of her getting information from the the keep before um in a previous episode so uh, we know she's mm-hmm. a little, um, you know, paying people for information. I, I kind of like it. I, I, cause they have so many characters that they introduce that they need to introduce. I kind of like that. We got these character introductions. We're seeing, you know, how that they're weaving themselves into the fabric of the politics. Yeah. And as long as it pays off later, which I assume it will, because the writing has been so amazing, then I'm totally on board with it. Yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if other people will forget who these characters are. Like, I saw her four episodes ago. Who is she again? That's what that's what the last week on or previously on is for. Because like it yeah, did show so. that it did show you know her um, that scene okay. with her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like in Game of Thrones, Littlefinger and Varys weren't necessarily in every episode, probably, but they were enough mm-hmm. of you know staples to the show that you always kind of had an idea of what they were trying to do. I guess this would probably contradict the book canon, but I think it might have been maybe a little bit uh, more connective tissue if Laris had found himself onto the small council somehow and was like around for the meeting that Allison was running. Maybe I mean, there's the beast be- beast below the boards. Beneath the boards. Beast below yeah. the boards. Yeah. Hey, do you know? What do you know what that means? Because I maybe I should, I, but I forgot. It's just speculation at this point. No, there's not. I mean. As as somebody who's read the books, I don't know exactly what that means. I like that they're adding in these little things. Um, I know some people have said like the boards may mean the, the table boards, you know, the board the table that they were feasting on. Um mm. and uh others say, you know, floorboards, whatever. Uh, but we know that in a castle there aren't many of those. Uh <laughs> so who knows? Uh, I guess we'll find out. Uh, there's many things that it could point to, but it doesn't seem very specific. So Nice. All right. So let's close with uh, who won and lost the episode for you guys. Which character did the most to advance their cause and which one failed? Hmm, thank I mean, you. There's, that's a tough one, one. there's one that lost that's pretty obvious. <laughs> go, go for it, Steven. I, I'm interested. Well, in I mean, Vayman failed. Oh, yeah. Vayman. Yes. Yeah. Nobody liked Vayman. And uh, well, I mean, I guess he did get to, uh, you know, complete his death wish and just pull out, say they're bastards in front of the court. Yeah. Uh, and so he got a little bit of that, but I mean, who cares? It's so interesting because he was right. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't wrong in anything. He well, was no, because he was trying to pass pass over Bela's claim you know so he he was definitely self-driven there yeah no for sure but 
Okay. Yeah. He's, he's obviously the loser. It's a little, you know, a little shades of Ned Stark as well, who showed up at King's Landing, said the children were illegitimate and uh, also didn't work out. That's well interesting. For him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Cause yeah. I mean, I guess that's what Ned did. Dang. Yeah. That Dang is... it, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Uh, uh who won yeah. the episode for me oh side note by the way man a little lame for my guy corliss to just be sidelined and no mention of what's going on with him just he's mortally injured this is yeah that, that i mean maybe i could have like done with a shot of him heroically fighting someone and getting hurt or something mm -hmm. cool but yeah just off screen um who won the episode i think rhaenyra her going to uh, Viserys and kind of pleading with him was ultimately uh, a big way. You know, she turned the tides a lot for the the blacks here, who previously it wasn't looking great for. So I think she did. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the loss was Otto, um, <laughs> just because. Uh, yeah. There were many, there were many scenes in which he was just like he wanted to be in control there on the throne, and then Viserys walks in, and he's mm -hmm. like, "Oh, well," and uh, yeah. uh -huh. Viserys chose not to take the milk of the poppy and uh, was actually able to think properly, and uh, that screwed him over. <laughs> and then the scene, you know, uh, where Rhaenyra and Alicent make up, and he just kind of gives Alicent the eye, like, "What are you doing?" Uh -huh. uh, yeah, see, it took like did. everything in his power not to jump in there and try to stop what was happening. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because he's not that type of person. Like, he won't. Uh, he's not gonna, uh, you know, let himself get angry around people or uh, let his emotions show. Um, but I think the the winner. Um, I would agree, uh, Rhaenyra. I think that she um being the first to make a toast um and try and make up with allison there was huge mm -hmm. i don't know if allison would have done the same um and then also her um just kind of like trying to you know trying to teach her jace valerian and um i just saw a lot of like good mothering um from her um which was which was cool. And then also, yeah, that scene with her and Viserys uh, and her finally like allowing herself to feel for him and showing him that um, she really cared and that she, you know, this, this weight of, of uh, being next in line um, actually meant something to her. Um, I think all of you guys got the, got the, best picks um we took the obvious ones <laughs> but so i think that the um okay then i'm gonna go with the controversial take the best winner and loser was Viserys, because i think yeah okay i think one he won because he finally got his wife and his daughter to make up at least for a little bit he asserted his dominance he you know tried he up until his very last moment he was the binding blue of the family, I guess the second to his very last moment. And then even when he died, he's like my love, you know, indicating that, you know, he's going to go join his, uh, what's, what's her name? His first, his, his first wife. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and, and, but, you know, lost as well, because he kind of like that prophecy, you know, wasn't with it all the way enough to realize that was Allison and not Renera is bad and kind of, maybe messed everything up at the very last second so i think yeah big dub and a big l for for the that's fair yeah. yeah yeah that's a good pick yeah i like it all right two more episodes two more buckle up buckle up and, i guess uh, here we go yeah in um you know in the history of game of thrones seasons the ninth episode is always the craziest so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Hopefully the episode that. is where the, uh, the heads roll and then the 10th episode is dealing with it. Yep. <laughs> Wrapping some things up. Nice. All right. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Hayden. See you guys yeah, later. Thank you.